is Louis Germain with the Ombudsman of the United Nations Office in Geneva, and who was also the Ombudsman for ITC. The reason I thought it was essential to have him come and speak to you is because the whole system of justice of the United Nations, of which you are part of one way or the other, has become extremely complex. At least, yes, it has become extremely complex. <laughs> and there has actually been an increase in the use of the system of justice. There are more and more complaints being brought out. And I'm not a specialist of this system of justice. And I thought the best person to speak about it, about a formal and informal, is Ombudsman. He can explain to you what are the difference between formal and informal. Let me just tell you one word. I recently followed the OIOS investigation training on investigation of what they call prohibitive conduct, which is harassment in the workplace and sexual harassment. And the number of complaints is increasing so much that OIOS is organizing investigation training. And it was a fascinating training because I realized that these days the system has become extremely complex and in a way more and more conflictual. And um, you, what you really want to avoid as a manager is to fall into the trap that a conflict goes beyond the informal resolution. So we, please, tell us a little bit about... Thank you, Alice. Good to see you again. Yes. It's been a while. Thank you. Hi. 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 Good afternoon. Um, to make it less complex, as I said, I took the liberty of bringing some booklets for you. Mm -hmm. So I would ask each one of you to take one of each of these booklets. Uh, if I can pass one right now, so that we uh, we'll be able to go through it as we go along. Yeah. So we don't have much time. So pass. Are we good? why the Swedes would pay for the production of a booklet. Uh, it's because the Ombudsman concept actually came from Sweden. And so it's basically a system that the United Nations inherited. And the purpose of it was to be able to introduce... Uh, Louis, can you come to my room because that everybody can see you? Can you all see me? I'm a big guy, so... <laughs> can you see me? Yes, okay. So as I was saying, the Swedes introduced the system. It was initially intended to be a way for the royal family to get in touch or keep in touch with the local people, the folks. So that way their concerns could be relayed to the royal family, and they would then be able to be properly addressed. Now, in the UN context, it is actually the informal pillar of the justice system that the UN has in place. If you look at this booklet, and you look at the last page of it, there is a little chart. Can you all see it? Now basically what that chart does is that it defines for you the United Nations administration of justice system and what recourse is available to staff in the event that they have a grievance that they would like to have addressed. You will notice that at the very bottom, you have the position of the staff member and the grievance and you notice that there are three possible options that are available to address the problem. The first one, which is on the extreme left-hand corner, is the Office of Staff Legal Assistance. That is the office that staff has access to, where they can go to get legal advice on preparing cases where they have a grievance that they want to bring before the administration. In the center, you notice that uh, the staff member also has the option of going to what they call the management 
a valuation unit. What that means is that uh, if there's a decision that's taken that the staff member disagrees with, he or she can actually go first to the organization itself to request a review of that decision. And that office basically has the mandate to determine if that decision taken was legal or not. And they make that initial ruling for the staff. Now, the management evaluation unit, in reviewing that appeal, can make a determination as to whether or not that case can be handled in the context of a mediation. And I'll get down to that later on. If uh, the management evaluation unit decides that the decision that was taken was legal, the <coughs> staff member can then take the case to what they call the United Nations Dispute Tribunal, which is the first instance of the court system of the UN. That uh, tribunal is actually a formal court system that's uh, staffed by judges and lawyers, and they basically have cases much like you would have in any tribunal systems. The tribunal, in reviewing the case, can decide to go through a process of adjudicating it and rendering a judgment, or it can refer the case to mediation. But if it does go and actually take a judgment, and the staff member disagrees with that judgment, the staff member can go to the last stage of the court system, which is the United Nations Appeals Tribunal. Are you all with me up to now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, to the right-hand corner, you will notice that they talk about the Office of the Ombudsman and Mediation Services, which is where I come from. The mediation process can actually come into the picture in three cases. The staff member can come directly to us, or the staff member can actually, or the case can be referred by either the Management Evaluation Unit or the Administrative Tribunal. So in all three of those cases, the case can actually come to attention. Any questions up to now? Yeah? Okay. Now, um, if you look at uh, the other booklet that we have, the other one, it basically gives you a history of the Office of the Ombudsman and Mediation Services. You'll notice that uh, the office was first established in 2002 by uh, then Secretary General Kofi Annan. And at the time, it was a centralized office that was located in New York, with the Ombudsman occasionally traveling to field offices to actually meet staff and address their concerns. But um, it became increasingly clear that that office was inadequate to meet the needs of all the staff. And because of that, in 2009, the United Nations, as part of the reformulation of the justice system, decided to establish a decentralized system with seven regional offices, of which the Geneva office was one, to actually bring the services of the Office of the Ombudsman directly to the staff in the field. And so that office has been in existence since 2009. In uh, 2010, I was appointed to actually come to Geneva, and I've been here basically for the past three and a half years. And essentially, um, we provide three types of services to staff. The first one is, uh, we provide what we call organizational ombudsman activities, meaning that we are there to help staff members deal with workplace-related conflicts on a case-by-case -case basis. We also can actually assist staff to be able to handle the cases in the context of mediation, where we actually serve as a third-party neutral, meaning that we facilitate a discussion between the staff members so they can actually try, try to resolve the cases. The third option that we have, which is very important, is we serve uh, the role of a change agent, meaning that as we meet individually with staff, we also try to identify what we call systemic issues, which are issues that we believe are inherent to creating conflicts in the system. Those issues are then fed back to the policy makers in the organization so that as they look at policies and they, re they reformulate them, they have an opportunity to actually take into consideration the concerns that we've identified and bring them into the context of the policies that are created. So basically, these are the fundamental roles that we serve in the office. And uh, I'll open up the floor for questions to you. Can you speak a little bit about the confidentiality of your office? OK. The uh, office operates on the basis of four principles. The first one is that we are independent. That means that we do not have a reporting structure relative to the offices that we cover in the region where we are located. It means, for example, that I would not report to the head of our ITC or any of the heads of the UN entities that are based in Geneva. We are also confidential. That means that when staff members come to us, 
what is discussed with us remains confidential, except if we have strict permission from the staff to actually discuss that issue with any other entity. We are also uh, informal, which means that we are not a record-keeping entity for the United Nations. We are not there to collect information on behalf of the organization. And indeed, uh, the UN court system does not have the authority to compel the ombudsman to testify in proceedings there. And uh, the last uh, point, which is extremely important, is that we are inf uh, impartial and neutral. We are not there to advocate either for the staff or the administration. Our concern is basically to look for fair solution and fair practices in the organization. And so when an issue is brought to attention, our primary preoccupation is to ensure that whatever decision that was taken was done in a fair manner consistent with the rules and regulations of the UN. Any other questions? Any questions? Can you give maybe some example without breaking confidentiality? If you could bring some example of, to make it more concrete what you do. Well, there are different types of cases. Uh, you have some very serious, sad cases. Uh, to tell you, I'm handling a case right now of a staff member who's uh, facing some difficulty in the workplace. And that difficulty stemmed from a very difficult personal tragedy that the person just has, went through, has gone through. It's a staff member well, whose son, unfortunately, was severely sick mentally and decided to basically end his life. Now, parallel to that, the staff member is having difficulty doing the work. The manager, of course, is concerned about the productivity and wants to make sure that the staff member is able to address the work. The staff member, of course, is completely distraught and is completely unable to focus on the work. It's a small office. They have about, I think, uh, seven people in there. So if one person is not able to pull his or her weight, it impacts on the entire team. Making matters worse, they're in the process of preparing for a major conference, which means that everyone has to pull their weight to move the ship forward. And so you have, on the one hand, the managerial, aspect of the work, the operation. Okay, so. And then parallel to that, you have, of course, the staff member's personal situation. And so, interestingly enough, each side came to me not knowing that the other one had come to speak to me. And so the idea now is to find how do we take those two situations, which are both critical, and find common grounds that will help both sides to be able to move forward. You want another example? Yep. Funny one. <coughs> a staff member came by to see me because he had been involved in a relationship with a colleague in the office. See, it's funny, no? <laughs> but it gets even better. So they're in this relationship, which lasted many years, which was known to everyone in the office, and then the relationship fell apart. A week after that, the gentleman finds out that his companion was actually having an affair with their director. <laughs> now it gets even funnier. <laughs> he, in the course of working in that office, would often be sent on assignment to the field. And sometimes these assignments, which were supposed to last a week or two weeks or a month, got extended into two months, three months. And for him, it was always a mystery. Why am I being asked to stay that long when I was supposed to go for a short period of time? So once he discovered what was going on, he started to try to connect dots. The reality is that the dots may really not be connected, because it may be that the extensions were strictly based on operational needs. But now he has in the back of his mind that Mr. Director had an ulterior motive. And then he starts looking at promotions that he was denied, which potentially would have meant that his companion would have had to leave with him. And so it was in the interest of the director to keep him there because of other purposes. So he's completely distraught. He's very upset. He doesn't know exactly what to do. So we're still now discussing what are the options that are available for that case. But I had to really fight hard to keep a straight face. Yeah. Yeah. That's the uh, theme of La Belle de Seigneur. Yeah? 
Yeah, in that book that was written back in the, what is it, the 60s or something. Mm -hmm. Because the whole theme was that the, at the time, it was the DG of UNOG was supposed to have been sending somebody away for extended periods because he was having an affair with, uh, I forget the girl's name, anyway, the, the heroine in the book. So I guess it's like somebody's read the script and was redoing the same thing. <laughs> and I am sure this is just one of many other cases that we might not be aware of. Alice might know of a few cases, I'm sure. Uh, there was a question there. If, if that case is proven to be right, I mean, if those allegations are proven to be right, then it's a case of abuse of authority. Well, they would be very serious. Uh, one of the suggestions, for example, so far was for this person, the visitor who came to see me, to get in touch already with the ethics office. I don't know if you are getting a briefing on the road of the ethics office. No, we did not. You have not? OK, That's so I'll touch on a little bit on that as well. OK. The ethics office is a centralized office that's based in New York. And their role basically is to ensure that whistleblowing protection and protection from retaliation and non-conflictual of interest issues are respected. That they are there to basically monitor the conduct and behavior of staff across the board and at all levels. So in a situation like this, the question would be, did the director, in the exercise of his functions, potentially created a conflict of interest for himself? Because he was taking decisions which ideally he should not really have been involved in because of his personal interest. Then the question is, if in fact he had denied promotions and things of that nature, did he perhaps overstep his authority? Because he was taking factors into consideration that he really should not have been. And so the ethics office in this case would have a role in initiating initially an investigation, which OIOS may actually have to undertake. And depending on the outcome of that investigation, decide what sanctions, if necessary, should be taken against the director. Okay. There was another question there. Okay. Is there anything, any written rules uh, outlining the interpretation of interpersonal relationships in the office? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically what the organization says is that there should not be, people who are involved in a personal relationships should not be in a reporting yeah. structure. So meaning that you cannot be having an affair with someone who reports directly to you or be married to someone who's directly reporting to you. It doesn't matter what the relationship is. But the whole idea is that if you're in a reporting lines structure, then the potential of you being transparent could be compromised by the fact that you have this relationship. So it's not only discouraged, it's forbidden. Uh, we've had some situations in the past where, in fact, you've had shifts of personnel. Uh, I know of one case, for example, where in my former department, we had a staff member whose husband was parachuted into the, as the director of the division through a cabinet reshuffle. And so suddenly she found herself in the direct line of reporting. And this was a decision that was taken outside of the framework of the office itself. But once it became known that in fact this relationship was going to exist, she was shifted out because that was of course the easiest decision to actually handle. But yeah, the rules are very clear on that. Is there something we should be talking about, Geraldine? <coughs> <laughs> no, just making inquiries. <laughs> Go ahead, tell us. <laughs> it's all confidential here. <laughs> it's only case study, right? Yeah, yeah. When, when the ombudsman's on the clock, it's confidential. Okay, so whatever you say, you say here stays here. Anything else? I think it's important to, to understand the role of the ombudsman and as much as possible to go through the informal conflict resolution than the formal. Because once you get into a formal resolution issue, it becomes a no IOS investigation. You end up in a situation that could last for years and not really resolve any problem. Yeah. One, one, one important element there, and what, uh, following up on what uh, Alice just mentioned, is that when you take a case to the formal process, first of all, the mandate of the court dictates that the court can only be looking at the legality of the decision that was taken. So basically, the whole purpose of the court is to, de is to determine if that decision that was taken was consistent with the rules and regulations of the organization or not. 
What the court cannot take into consideration, which is extremely important, is the relationship dynamics that exist in the office. Meaning that if you decide that you want to challenge a decision that was taken by your manager, you're free to do so. You go to the court, you file your case, the judge will review the case, and the judge will make a determination as to whether or not you are right or the manager was right. But the reality is that in a conflict of this case, you are convinced of the righteousness of your position, as is the manager. So when that decision is rendered by the court, one person is not going to be happy. And potentially, neither one of you will be happy. Because the reality is that when you go there, you have expectation as to what you expect that outcome to be. The judge may fully meet your expectations, because the judgment that gets rendered is exactly what you are looking for. The judge may only partially meet your expectation. And then you may feel, well, I really didn't get exactly what I was looking for. And a clear example of that, for example, is if you apply for a vacancy, you don't get it. You file a case because you're unhappy with the selection decision. The judge may come back and offer you monetary compensation because they come at the end and realize that, yeah, perhaps the process was not done properly, perhaps there were some inconsistencies with the rules, and so the judge finds in your favor and decide, okay, monetary compensation. You, on the other hand, may decide that that was not what I was looking for. I wanted that promotion. That was the reason why I wanted to file my, file my case. So what it means is that you get a judgment which was favorable to you, but you're not totally satisfied with the outcome. At the same time, the administration may not be very happy either because they were convinced that whatever they did was correct. Yet, there is the reality that the two of you will have to continue to work side by side. So the relationship dynamic is not something that the court can take into consideration. And so, even though the case went to the tribunal, the tribunal was able to address it, there is still some underlying resentment. It could be from one side or from both sides. And so, it's not necessarily creating a healthy working environment that both parties could actually put their problems behind them and move forward. The beauty, if you will, of the informal process is that we are not there to impose any judgment. I'm not a judge. I'm not even a lawyer. What we're doing is we're facilitating a discussion between the two parties. We help in facilitating that, facilitating that discussion by bringing in an outside perspective to allow you to look at a third aspect of that conflict that neither one of you may be aware of because you're so caught up in your positions. And in doing so, hoping to get the two of you to come to an understanding. That's actually coming not from the ombudsman, but from you directly. To facilitate a resolution that at the end of the day, the two of you can live with. So that way, you can be able to put that issue that created that source of conflict behind you. Because that solution that will have been found will have come directly from you, and not from the ombudsman. And so, you're in control of the process from the start all the way to the end. There are no surprises. And if, in fact, there is going to be a solution, that solution can only come about with your willing participation. And that gives you a lot more empowerment than you will ever find in the formal system. Food for thought. John, you have a question at that, huh? No, I don't have any questions. <laughs> I know exactly really what you can do. Okay. He has a nice office as well. So. <laughs> you are welcome to visit. You had a question. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Can the third party initiate uh, mediation when he sees that temperature is going up? Highly discouraged. And I can tell you there have been many cases where I would get a phone call from a manager saying, well, I have these two staff members. They're not getting along. It's creating a disruption to the office. I would like you to help them mediate a solution. Sorry, cannot help you. Reason being is uh, if mediation is to be successful, there has to be a willingness of the parties themselves to actually initiate that discussion. If I'm coming to you, it's like, for example, you know, if you take a school environment setting where you have two kids having an argument in school and the teacher comes over and says, shake hands, be friends again. And they do it because the teacher is there and says, yeah, go ahead and do it. The moment they leave school, bam, they go back at it because it was never really their intent to actually resolve the case that way. So unless they are willing to actually come forward and say, OK, we want to make peace, it's really not worth it. Now it's jump. Yeah.
but, okay. but, but I, I think what maybe, you know, just as a caveat to that, I mean, sometimes you need a peacemaker. And, and I think that if there's a, at least the perception, because communications have broken down between parties, mm -hmm. that there is no point of engagement. There may be a wish, but there may be no um, expectation of any success. And then I think that you, your, your intervention can sometimes help. The way that it, it, it can work, and I'll tell, give you just one case, in fact, right now, I'm meeting the parties actually on Monday. Uh, an interested party, and I'm using that term because I don't really know the relationship of that individual relative to the conflict. But I received a call from someone who specifically talked about two colleagues about an office environment and a conflict situation. And the person asked, can you assist in helping them to mediate the situation? And I said, well, I cannot do it if the idea is for me to contact them and ask them to come to see me. You, however, can talk to them individually and share with them the wisdom of engaging in an informal mediation. If at the end of your discussion with them, they feel that this is indeed something that they would like to pursue, I would welcome them with open arms. And so that's the context that it's done. I think as the manager, I'm really thinking it is the responsibility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not to let things just to you know to fester and just to go to the ombudsman, but to get the parties to agree to go to the ombudsman. Yeah. That's the first and that's the responsibility of managers, not to hold their hands and go to the ombudsman and say, Can you please deal with it? No, the supervisor has to find a way to get the conflict parties to agree to go to the ombudsman. That's managerial responsibility. Even more critically. Even more critically than that, this is just an extension of what Alice just mentioned. When, we, when I look at the statistics of the office, for example, what I see is the tip of the iceberg. Because the role that I perform is a voluntary one, meaning that for staff members to take the initiative to come to see me, they have to do it themselves. So for every case where somebody decides to pick up that phone or to go to the, to the email and send me an email, I ask myself, how many other cases might there be that I'm not aware of? Because people have decided for one reason or another, it's not worth the trouble, I don't want to have any, uh, issue, any problems down the line. There are a number of reasons that could hold people back from actually taking that step and coming forward. However, as the managers, you have a frontline seat. You meeting on a daily basis with your colleagues and you're able to see firsthand where there is a potential for conflict. And so you have an opportunity to address that conflict at its very genesis before it gets to escalate into something that is much more problematic. Managers, and I'm not just talking about ITC, I'm talking about the larger UN from what I can see the observation. Many managers do not see conflict management as part of their responsibility. And there have been too many cases where managers say to people, go see the ombudsman. Now, I don't mind, because what it does is that it increases my statistical data and makes me look like a star before the General Assembly. But there are many, many cases that could be addressed at the very beginning if managers would recognize that as part of the managerial responsibility, they have to promote a healthy work environment, and that includes managing conflicts before they actually get to escalate too much. So if you forget everything I've said to you today, please remember that you, as individual managers, you have a responsibility to manage conflicts. That's part of your role. Anything else? Yeah, I have one more to there are no stupid questions in this. Yeah, no, stupid answers, yes, but not questions. Uh, are there also disputes between team of humans or departments, which can also go through this mediation? Well, yeah, um, the, uh, there's an old African proverb. And I'm not from Africa, by the way, but I know the proverb. And basically what it says is that when the elephants fight, the grass gets hurt. And so what happens is that when you're dealing with relationship dynamics, the higher it goes, the more destabilizing it becomes for the rest of the structure. And I can come point at several cases of uh, situations that I've handled here 
where you can see relationship problems between managers at the high, highest level, and you can see the destabilizing effect it's having on staff at the bottom. And these uh, signs can actually manifest themselves in various ways. You have, for example, situations where uh, just the reporting line gets completely untangled. I know of a case, for example, where there's a director who has made it very clear that he doesn't have any respect for one of his chiefs of service. So basically a D2 and a D1. And so what happens is that the subordinate staff, all the way down to your G3s, your G4s, your G5, when they have a conflict or when they have an issue, and they go to the chief of service and they make a request, and the chief of service says one thing, if they don't agree with that thing, they just bypass the chief of service and go to the director. And I'm not tracking statistical data, but I would say probably in 80 to 90% of the cases, the director overrules the chief of service. And so you end up with a situation where the environment has become completely chaotic because the, direct, the chief of service is very much conscious that her role, her authority, is not respected by the staff. Yet, at the same time, she feels completely powerless about it. And so she's not able to give proper instructions. The director seems somewhat happy with the situation, except for the fact that too many people are going to his door to complain about things. And so, constantly, the situation just keeps on mushrooming into a very, very complex situation. And so, when you look at that situation, you can actually go to the root of it, and you can see that, in fact, it's the relationship between these two that have actually impacted on everything else that's going on there. And you ask yourself, if that relationship issue were to be addressed, what would actually be the dynamic in terms of the relationship with the others in the wreck and file? <coughs> so it's an important point. And yes, you can in fact end up with situations where you have mass casualty type of situations, if you will, simply because of the impact of the relationship between the two. Pretty much like some wars. Hmm? Pretty much like some wars have happened because of personal and Indeed, indeed. The human mind is really complex, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think, but I think that she just wanted to, needs to go. I mean, do we have time for one more question, Paul? Sure. Okay, go ahead. Um, one last question. You, mm -hmm. you are an ombudsman for the, for the entire UN engineer, right? Well, that depends on what you mean by the entire UN in Geneva. I mean, you, yeah. you have many organizations yeah. to oversee from that perspective. Mm -hmm. Do you see that there are organizations that are more risky, more troublesome, or what is, or, or is, it, is it fairly the same um, distribution? That's, That's a tricky question. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are pockets of concerns. Let's put it this way. Uh, now, in terms of the coverage here, to give you an idea, the regional office of the Ombudsman basically covers all UN secretariat entities that are in Geneva. So uh, there are approximately, I believe at last count, maybe a dozen or so organizations that are here that all fall under the umbrella. Now, there, it's also a regional office, which means that it is not there strictly for offices in Geneva. We actually cover all UN secretariat entities uh, within the European continent, with the exception of Germany and Austria, because I have a counterpart in Vienna, who covers Austria, Germany, mm -hmm. Central Asia, as well as some of the uh, peacekeeping missions in the Middle East. Now, if you look at the workload distribution, it seems fairly clear. But what does happen is that our uh, head of office in New York, the Ombudsman of the United Nations, the Assistant Secretary General, often travels to field offices. And when he travels, he usually asks one or two of the regional numbers to accompany him. Mm -hmm. And so it's not unusual for me to get a phone call saying, you're going to Baghdad in two weeks. And in fact, last year, uh, in May, I was in Baghdad, and then in September, I was in Afghanistan. I thought that once I'd done Baghdad, I would be spared another one like that, but I went to both. Mm -hmm. And there's a possibility that this year, since I was there and I had some issues, that there may well be some follow-up visits to one or both of those locations. So it's that's the